It doesn't happen by accident. Say, I got it. So let's find out what it is that we need to get. <clears throat> so that I must be single. Go with me to Luke, please. Chapter 11, 34 through 36. I'm going to change the word lamp. Stick that word light bulb in there, okay? All right, so it says the lamp or the light bulb of the body is the what? Your eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, some translations say single. So let me explain. Your eye, you have one spiritual eye. You have two physical eyes. Your spiritual eye does not need to be on anything else but Christ. Can you say amen? So when I look at you, you could be the Andreas person. When I look at you, through the eye of God being single, I see the potential of who you could be in Christ, not who you are right now. Hello? So if our eyes single or wholesome, your whole body will also be full of light. So what does the enemy start doing? He gets you to become double-minded. Your eyes are on a problem. Your eyes are on Jesus. Your eyes are on Jesus. Now your eyes are on a problem. And then if you're not careful, you're going to dwell on that. Now you're going to talk about it. And you're going to be just like this. Tossed to and fro. Because tossing to and fro is a switching from seeing something physically. As seeing what the word says spiritually. Now you can focus on the word no matter what you see physically. Amen. But if you let what you see physically overcome your mind, you won't be able to focus on the word. So have you got that? So if your eye is single, focused on Christ, you're going to be filled with the right light. But if your eye is not single, out of focus is actually what the scripture says, then you're going to be filled with what you call enlightenment, but it's going to be deception. Well, what do you mean? Well, look at all of these religions that are in the world. How could the enemy trick them like that? Because it says, be careful that the light that be in you be not darkness. Because great is that darkness. Say, I got it. So what do we do? We focus on Jesus. Who do we meet with first time? Every morning. Jesus. Who do we focus our eyes on? Jesus. So now you're getting it. Now to stick with that as a habit takes God. Can you say amen? Because we forget. So again, first point, the lamp, the light bulb of the body is what? So watch what you put it on. Okay. All right. So we either see good. Or we see evil. What did God say to Adam and Eve? Don't eat of that tree. Because it's the tree of the knowledge of. Yeah. Not God's good. Satan's evil. No, 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 no. Man's good. What man can do being good without God. And how man can be corrupt and depraved with evil. Now. If. Your eyes have been taken off of God. And all you can see is good men and evil men. Good things and evil things. You can see how Satan has a heyday with deception. But God didn't leave us in this state. Jesus Christ came. And the light shines into darkness. And the darkness can't shut it off. People see that there's another alternative. Now fast forward it until now. You've had God in your heart, right? How many here could use a little more victory in your walk? Put your hands up. Amen. So what I'm going to tell you is something that you and God must practice daily for this to happen. How many here like to get up in the morning and not have any pain? Amen. Not have your mind go off somewhere? This is how you do it. Not because I say so, but because the word says so. Listen, I could yell and scream and jump around and be the most charming person in the world. I can't convince you of anything. 
But if the word says it, remember, he never changes. He has lots of grace and truth and mercy for us. He's wanting us to get a hold of the life preserver of the truth so he can yank us out of here. Can you say amen? But if you haven't got a hold of these principles, he's going to have a hard time yanking you out of here because we could become like Lot's wife and want to hang out with all the corruption. Jesus said that when he preached, people would reject him because they love their sin more than they love the light. We know the, the whole problem with that is our flesh loves sin and our spirit wants to serve God. There's two of us, remember? All right, so let's take you, let's have a good time with you. All right, so the only way that you and I can have our eyes to be good and focused on Christ is when we become born again. And then we have to turn off the old way of thinking and how God teaches a new principle of thought and thinking. Can you say amen? How many know God's way is higher than our ways? Yes. Amen. How many know there's a way that seems right unto a man? It's twice in Proverbs. But the end thereof are the ways of death. But when we get God's idea, even the silly things of life have fullness to them. Amen. All right. So let's go down and find out. Second Corinthians 3. Look at this scripture, verses 14 through 16. All right, now we've been talking about the eye, right? People don't have an alternative that they think they have. So think of this. We know Jesus is the answer, right? So Satan picks religion as an alternative, He makes people religious. They talk about God, but nobody knows him. Jesus talked out this way. He says, you honor me with your lips, but your heart's far from me. He's not trying to put him down. He was trying to say, you need to get me in your heart so you understand my ways. But instead, we're trying to live for God the way we used to live. Okay, so let's get into this. All right. 2 Corinthians 3.14 says, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil or covering remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Because the veil is taken away only in Christ. So people want to be good, but they don't have Jesus in their heart. They couldn't be good if they wanted to. They can be a little bit good. They can help a little bit. But without God's power, we know that we can't overcome. We all know that. So listen to this. Because in Christ, the veil is taken away. But even it, to this day, when Moses is being read, the veil lays on their heart. Nevertheless, but when somebody turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And God says, now let me teach you the alternative message, the truth. And we shall know the what? And the truth is ministry. So say, I've got the goods in me. I got the goods. But I've got to walk the way the Lord lines it out. And it's, an, it's an, okay, I, I'm going to try really hard to walk. No. You meet with God and say, God, help me walk that way. So if you get some success, who gets the credit? God! Don't take success. You get a little money, don't spend it all. Just because you can. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Seek the Lord. Get his wisdom on things. You only have one life. Let's hope when you leave here, you leave a memorial unto God and not a mess for your children to clean up. Moving right along. <laughs> Amen. So I don't want to get in trouble here. So God has begun a perfect work in you. Let him finish it. Philippians 1 6 says, being confident in this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day you go home to be with the Lord. Now, are you going to let him continue his work? Hello? All right. Listen to this. Gone down further in Philippians chapter 2, 12 and 13. Listen to this. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, Paul saying, 
not as in, in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to do his will and to do for his good pleasure. So in other words, team up with God. Can you say amen? We need to find out his words, his teaching, not religious teaching. Religion stops at the places where we, we become opposed to one another. Old time religion is women, don't cut your hair. You're going to go to hell. So if you cut your hair, now you're opposed. Jesus never said that. So Satan comes in with something. Remember, everything he does is to get one another to oppose one another. Listen, you might not like me, but you better love what I have to say to you. You understand? So this shell is going to change. But it's the goods inside. You, you have a shell too. And the goods inside are wonderful. Can you say amen? You got to let them out. It's got to come out in everything you do, everything you say. Oh, God, help me do that. Amen. Help me to do that very thing. So look at this. So he said, work out your own salvation, you and God. So point one, God is in your spirit now. And you take the back seat and let him take the driver's seat. Someone would say, well, how do I do that? I'm supposed to be busy. I have a job. I got to work. You can be busy, but still be resting in God while you're busy because Jesus is making the point decisions. He's your point man. So you meet with him. You get the instructions. You know you have a job. So you know you're going to go and work. But you can go with Jesus and be happy about it. Or you can go, oh, it's going to get through the day. So when you go with Jesus and you're happy about it, God begins to tell you something all through your routine. See, the outward shell is you're working. The inward shell is God's fellowshipping with you. Teaching you and showing you if you're listening. Amen. I was a truck driver. Great time to be a truck driver. God can talk to you plenty when you're driving. Stopping and delivering packages. I just pretended that I, every package I delivered was Jesus. Amen. Every little gift, every little thing I say, it's, I'm giving out Jesus. So I don't want to tell the parking meter where to go. Unless it's to Jesus. Get, Anyway, you, you got the humor in it. Wow, what a big responsibility. But not so because you're not having to do hardly anything but obey the master. You're, you're, you're captain of your salvation, Jesus. So catch this. So our eyes being single. The key to winning our race, okay, is to keep our eyes on Jesus. Okay, listen to this. God is in your spirit. Our eyes must stay focused on the word in Christ. Who can quote me John 1.1? 1, 1? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So when we look at the word, we're looking at Christ. You have an Old Testament word that points us to Christ, gives us the do's and don'ts of people that tried to follow him without faith. And then in the New Testament, we have God living in us. Now we're being learned, we're learning, excuse me, how to walk with Christ. And believe it or not, many Christians love God. They might have been in the ministry, but have been very little teaching how to walk with him. Hello. Remember when you were small and your big brother was with you? Those bullies left you alone. Me, when I was in high school, I was kind of scrawny and little and thin. You know, they pick on me a lot. So I would surround myself with some very big friends. What I'm trying to say to you is, you have somebody bigger than anybody can imagine living on the inside of you. And you need to wake up in the morning and realize that you're walking through your day with almighty God. Who dare pick on you? 
But we get picked on when we're drawn away from that relationship into ourself again. Somebody insults you, so you let them have it. <laughs> Hello. Satan has to bring us out of that realm with fellowshipping with God, out back into our old self so we'll respond and react in the flesh. Hello. You know the scripture, it says in James, every man's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lusts. So remember the Israelites? God rained down manna on them, didn't he? Boy, did they love it. Well, for a while they did. But you got to know something about yourself. Even the good you'll grow tired of if you don't keep Jesus fresh every day. You'll lose appreciation for it. Don't. Your whole life is because of God. You see? So to keep from losing appreciation, you meet with them every day. You get refreshed. You get recharged. You get rejuvenated. Adjusted. Then you get up. You let what's on the inside of you walk out through the outside of you. While you're at rest, you're busy. Somebody says, you, you just, something about you look real rested and peaceful. Man, I've never been so busy in my life. What's the key? I'm resting in God. He's taking the lead, giving me the ideas. I'm simply obeying him instead of trying to come up with the ideas myself. Duh. Which sometimes don't work out very good. Say, I got that. That was worth two million bucks for you. Do it God's way, even if it's something you think you know. Do it God's way. Consult him. Say, Lord, I'm, I'm stepping out here in faith. I need your help. God says, great, let's, just, let's do this. Remember, God loves you. He's not having a problem with you. Even when you blow things and mess up, he's not having a problem with you. He knew you were a, a piece of work when he got you. We were, we were a piece of work. We still are. So let's admit it and let God have his way. Don't start, you know, busting a thing and trying to impress everybody. Doesn't work. All right, so moving right past this. Almost to where I need to get you. See, I got everything now, right? All right. So the fear and the confusion in life does not come from God. Say amen. It comes from the outside in, hoping to draw us away with our relationship with God. All right? But you have God inside of you to focus on. You have the word to put before your eyes. So, we as Christians must ask God for help to stay focused, to stay appreciative, being filled with the Spirit, in the morning will make you enjoy the rest of your day. That's not to say you won't have a challenge, but the challenge won't get to you as much. You ever notice that sometimes there are times when little things really bother you. I mean, it's just a little thing and you're going, wow. You know you're in the flesh. You know that you're, you're operating in that realm. So you just quickly stop, get readjusted with God, and then say, ah. That's nothing. Nothing for God. Well, it's nothing for God. Let him come down here. And we use uh, Scott. Let him come down here and run this machine. <laughs> he is running it through us, through us, through what we learn. The idea is we want to make God so feel welcome and, and just to familiarize ourselves with that relationship that we wouldn't want to be anywhere else without including God in, in, on anything. Say amen. amen. You're going to work on your car? Bring God in. You're going you're gonna to step up a new responsibility, maybe at, on the job, and you've got now more responsibility. Bring God in there. We have not because? Yes, not. That's right. And so we just need to remind one another. It's wonderful walking with God, isn't it? Amen. All right, Hebrews 12, please. One and two.
Jesus is our example there, but this is a really prime, neat scripture. It says in verse 1, Hebrews 12, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, did you know all the saints that went on before you, they can look down periodically, see how you're doing, look down and says, Hey, Terry, go for it, brother, don't give up. Hey, Chance, you could do this. Hey, Piggy, you could do that. They're, they're rooting us on. They're not looking at all the dumb stuff we do. They're rooting us on. Amen. Okay? And it says that we're surrounded with a greater cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside what is not necessary. Every weight, every sin, the sin nature which is easily ensnares us. That's our flesh. And let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. What is that race? It's your entire life. You have your race to run. No one else can run that race. You're not in competition with anyone else about your life. You might think you are, but you're not. And you see how foolish it is to compare your walk with other people's walks. How frustrated you would get because our eyes are not supposed to be on man, are they? They're supposed to be on where? God. And so the race that's set before us, we, we, in order to run successfully our life, we have to look to who? Look what it says. It says, lay aside the weight, the sin that so easily ensnares us, traps us. And let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking unto Jesus. Who? The problem? What we got to fix in the church? What we got to fix in our life? Listen, if you focus on the things in your life that you need to fix, you're going to lose. You focus and take it to Jesus and say, Jesus, I can't do a thing about it. And man, I'm having a bad time. God says, sit down, watch, let me work it out in you. Amen. Can you sit still long enough to let the physician work in your heart? Are you going to get up off the operating table and bleed all over the emergency room? And that's what we often do. God starts to operate and he needs us to be still for a little bit so we can make the adjustment inside of our, our heart so that what we understand, we can walk out properly, not like the way we used to walk things out. Remember what you used to say back to the people who called you names? Why, thank you. <laughs> thank you for calling me that name. You do something like that, they're going to freak out. See, you got the upper handle. You're not looking to go to heaven. You're headed there. So everything everybody else is doing is either trying to keep you from there or they don't know why they're doing it. And if they're not helping you, then you can put it off in its own category and not pay it any mind. Why? Because you follow Jesus. Not people's suggestions. Unless they mean well. Are you with me? So looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the Father on high. Amen. Same scenario. We keep focusing on Jesus. What if we blow up? Keep focusing back on Jesus. What if you really hurt somebody? Apologize and keep focusing back on Jesus. Amen. Don't stop for an hour or a day or a week in self-pity. He's liable to sell you on a few more things. Don't receive anything that liar has to say. Jesus called him a liar in John 10, 44. He says, you are your father, the uh, liar. He was a liar in the beginning. He's not changed his ways. So if you listen to the nags of the world, the deceptions out there, it's all based on lies. So if you invest your money on a lie, you might receive a Bernie made off with your bucks. Remember Bernie made off with a guy with a name like that? I certainly wouldn't invest. <laughs> he made off with four point some odd billion dollars. Now what's he going to do to spend it? He's in jail. 
See, the whole system is set up to cause you to fail, thinking the whole time you're being a success. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. That's what I used to do. Oh, I was going to be a successful pastor. Oh, I was going to do this, and I'm going to teach college, and I was going to do that. But did I ask God? <laughs> when I started to ask God, God says, no, I got something different for you. What? <laughs> I'd rather do what God wants me to do than to try to figure out as what God wants me to do, just to find out I've been wasting my time. Moving right on. All right. Listen to this. It says, the key to winning our race is having a full life in Jesus. Putting him first. Two, eyes off the world. Well, I run a business. I need to know the markets. Well, yeah, but that's not what he's talking about. He says, get your eyes off the proverbial, you're going to be this, you're going to be that, and the world's going to help bring it you to that. No way, Jose. The only way you're going to get any success is God has to be first. Can I have an amen out there? Amen. He just has to be first. And then when he's first, who's going to take you out of God's will? When almighty God is watching over you. Amen. Only you can. By being distracted. So let's minimize our distractions. Okay. Eyes off the world. Eyes off of other people. Eyes off yourself. Eyes on Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. Well why Pastor Kerry? Well James 1.14 tells us. Through 17. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away from by his own desires. So if you don't produce yourself with God. And let him work on the desires of your flesh. And you go a couple of days without that prayer area of your life. Your flesh is going to start crying out. It's going to start complaining. Remember it's got a weed in it. What's the one thing in the garden you never plant and always shows up? What's the one thing that always shows up with your life you never planned on? The weed. So you do a little weed prevention in the morning. Can you say amen? You do a little plucking with Jesus. Can you say amen? And then when you get up from prayer, there's not an ounce of guilt or you shoulda, you coulda. It's all gone. And it's you and God walking through your day. All right, so let's quickly give you the breakdown. Okay. Number one, eyes off the world, and here's why. First John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I'll clarify in a minute. For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, see the word flesh, the lust of the eyes, if your eyes be single or double, and the pride of life. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. What would they sound like? Well, you can go back to the temptation of Jesus. First thing Satan presented to him was what? Lust of the flesh. You fasted 40 days. Here, make those stones bread. So here you're serving God. Nobody's appreciated. Y'all use me. I'm in a nice church. I've been in many good churches and helped out a lot. So I'm in a nice church, but nobody recognizes me. Nobody even gives me boo or anything. Doesn't care if I'm there or not. Should I be affected by that? Not really. You didn't go to that church to be recognized, did you? You see how silly our games play when the enemy starts to play games? And so now, nobody said hi to you, so now you're going to go find another church, not having asked God if you should or not. You see how we can just get caught up in things? And we mean well. But if you don't get yourself located with God first thing, you're going to make quality decisions not qualified for your life. And you mean well. But you got a little liar suggesting to you. Your neighbor doesn't like you anymore. You see? And so you got to control the thinking. You don't let your thinking run away. 
You control what you think. Say amen. So we don't love the world. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Not, those are not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away. That's why we don't invest in the world. I'll, I'll clarify in a minute. And the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God shall abide forever. So first of all, he's not talking about fishing and waterfalls. And Grand Canyons are so beautiful. And the Aurora Borealis. And he's not talking about that. He's talking about the system which he plays man. He plays man saying, I'm going to make you rich. You're going to find gold over here. And you're going to get that. And if you do this, you're going to get that. And then all of a sudden, we're, we're traveling. That's not, that's not the earth in its beauty. That's the world system in its corruption. Of course, nobody here ever felt they've been lied to. <laughs> corruption. So, rather than us giving a lot of time into the corruption that is there, we acknowledge it and then we go to God about it. And he gives us the wisdom for our day to be his child, to live in freedom, which gives him glory and, and fulfills his very purpose. And God can look right at the Satan. He says, yeah, my, my, my little son, Carrie. Amen. Look what he's doing. Nothing you can do about Satan because you have to go through me. Well, if you lift your hands off of carry, that he will curse you to his roots. First of all, we're in the New Testament. God is never going to take his hand off you. Never going to take his hand off you. Because he can't be accused that he did. Satan's the accuser. And God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's what he means. And to believe anything else is a deception and a lie. Now you know what kind of planet you're living in. Woo, dumb preach myself happy there. Eyes off the world, folks. Now you know why. But he that abides in my word shall abide forever. You see, the selfishness and the definition of the world is a false system. Listen, a false system of deception. That's what the word world means. It means cosmos. It's the word cosmos, artificial made up system. It's an artificial made up system Satan set up. God's system doesn't fail. But Satan's system goes up with the stock market, comes down with the stock market, goes over here, goes over there. There's no stability, no substance. And people are gambling in their life about it. No. Thank God I meet with God and guess what? He knows what to invest in. Hello? So what, Pastor Kerry? Lot's wife. Here's an example of a woman that loved the world. She gave up her life for it. How about you? Love not the world. If, if, if you love God and then love the world, then you're double-minded automatically. And everything you do is unstable and your prayers are not answered. So to avoid that, we love God and resist the deceptions of the world. Can you say amen? Somebody wants to bless you with something, ask God. Say, Lord, is this from you? Amen. And if it is, don't let me get over puffed up about it. Humble is what God told me to be. Always humble. Um, I, you might not like her. What's the lady that's a multimillionaire? She's probably a billionaire now. Oprah Winfrey. She was asked. Now, you might not like her or not, but this is an important thing for you. She was asked. What's the secret of, of getting all this? You were a pauper and everything? She says, being appreciative of God. Being thankful. Now, you would never know that about her, would you? No. She said, the time anybody got me a Kleenex, or I was very appreciative. 
you stay appreciative with God and the avenues are open for him to grace you with favor. You get all uptight and you're doing your own thing and God wants to give you something, but you're going to slap it out of his hand by the reaction of your flesh. Say, not me. So, love not the world, right? Two, eyes off other people. Folks, have you ever heard me say, please don't put your eyes on me? Are you planning to fail, Pastor Kerry? No, I'm not, but I'm capable of it. Don't put your eyes on ministers or presidents or people in authority to give you hope. Because they're, they're as human as all the rest of us. And look what happened with this election. Satan just had a heyday with everybody, getting them to choose sides. What does he want to do? He wants people to oppose one another. Wars, rumors of wars, lies, accusations. That's his whole system. But you and I haven't got time. We're following God. Our job is to redeem those who have been deceived out of the temptations of the world and into the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus says you go into all the world and preach the gospel because they don't have another alternative other than the deceptions that are in this world. And religion won't do it for people. We have huge churches of people being religious. Not putting them down at all. But you ask any one of them. Hey, tell me about your born again experience. <laughs> Blank space for about a half an hour. You should be able to tell when you got born again. Experience it. Testify of it. Tell people about what God is doing in your life daily. You should have a testimony every day of something God did specially for you. And if you don't, you're not paying attention enough. Because the fact that you can breathe is a gift of God. So we need to pay attention. So how much deception are you actually paying attention out there? And how much regulating world God, world God, which one am I listening to? Which one am I want to? Remember, we've been trained negatively almost all our lives. It wasn't until we came to know Jesus that we got the alternative, the truth. And boy, didn't the enemy fight you on that. Oh, you be careful. These people are fanatics. You know. The big one he uses, oh, that could be a cult. Well, listen, cults make you give up everything else, renounce your family, and make you sign something. We don't have any membership here. I just want you to meet with Jesus. And when we all get to heaven, I want to see you so smile and so happy because you made it. My job is not to see that you make it. My job is to preach, hope, and pray for you so you do make it. Thank God I can't do it for you and you can't do it for me. But we certainly can do it together, helping one another and building one another up. Can you say amen? All right, let me move on. So, eyes off other people. Listen, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12. Listen to this. For we dare not class ourselves... Or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. We don't hang around braggers. But they, measuring themselves by other people's examples, by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves, God says, are not wise. Polite version, fools. Because we're all individuals. We should be rejoicing. Oh man, I love what God's doing with BJ. I love what God's doing with Chance. And, and not comparing, you know. It's just childlike. So, we found out we're not to do that. Our eyes are not supposed to be in people. Acts 5, 29. Listen to this one. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said to the Sanhedrin, We ought to obey God rather than man. Say Amen. Rather than man. People, point one, people mean well, but are flawed. We can line up with what, a, what wisdom we have 
with the word of God. Amen? And what wisdom people tell us. I line up everything you say according to what God has told me. So, for example, in the area of, of, of church remodeling. I know exactly what this is supposed to look like. It's far from being there. So you come up with an idea and it's completely not lined up with what God told me it needs to be. Do I just say, oh, I don't want to hurt your feelings. Go ahead and do that. No. If it is chartreuse and you need something that's a different color, don't say yes to the person who's going to bring the color that doesn't match. Hello? So I'm going to say something to you. You're going to think about it. That's why I don't bring all kinds of speakers in to speak to you. Because not everybody has the same message. And I don't want them coming in and reversing what you already know to be the truth. By teaching you something else like, well, God's putting you through that. He's trying you, brother. You know, listen, God's not a dummy. He does that in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, he lives in you. He already knows where you're at and where you're not. <laughs> Hello. That's why God gets a sense of humor whenever I complain to him. Carrie, what are you doing? I'm praying. No, you're not. You're complaining. All right, moving on. <clears throat> So you got the idea, eyes off of other people. Because they mean well, they could hurt you. So if I promises you, listen, don't be a promiser. Don't run around telling people what you're going to do. Because Satan will see that you won't. Don't run around, people say, look, God's really blessing me. You can say all those kind of things because then he has to deal with God. But if you start bragging on what God wants you to do all the time, Eventually, he's going to catch, Satan's going to catch wind of it and try to make a fool out of us. So if you think that he doesn't do that, that's silly. So now that you know he does do that, you can deal with him by dealing with God and first thing in the morning, having God already pressurize you for the day. Do you know God already knows what your day is going to fulfill? Go to him and find out. And... Go to him and he'll pressurize you for any trials or problems that might end up showing their ugly face around you. But if you don't go with him, he won't, it'll take you by surprise. Gosh, I get surprised every once in a while. Amen. So let's go on. So you got to keep your eyes off of other people, right? So as much as other people are mean, well, and we love it, and I, as much as my commitment to you is I want to give you the word and not my opinion, you know, but still I am flawed. You don't believe me? You know, I, you know I'm flawed. But it doesn't mean that I give you my flaws. I give you my best every morning that I can't. Now, that might not be really good, but it's the best I could do. The same with you. You want to give God your best every morning. And let him just make you into something wonderfully beautiful like you were supposed to be. Whew. Can any good thing happen to Carrie? Yes. All right. So let's go on. Keep your eyes off yourself. This is the most dangerous one. How many here know that God resists the what? proud. Did you know that there's a positive end of pride? I'm going to describe it so you get it. a negative end of pride. For example, we know you've all been to a gym or something. You've seen people that are into themselves. And I'm just doing this for fun. I'm not trying to put anybody down. And they're really into me. They're in so much into me they could care less about you. <laughs> and you see men buffing out at the gym and women are as, as they fall to that too as much as men. Do you see what I'm saying? They're trying to improve their self without God's help. And there's some good in it. Bodily exercises of prophets, right? But, but the negative end of pride is really tricky to deal with. That's called depression. Because if you weren't on your mind, then you couldn't be depressed about yourself. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. I'm not a physician. I'm just telling you what the Bible tells you. So if we're focused any length of time on ourself, our walk, or this, or that, you're going to get depressed. Because your flesh is fallen. It doesn't have any good stuff with it. Only good that you have with it is what you expose with God in the morning. Put a little bit of God on your outside, man. Can you say amen? 
So if your eyes are on yourself, you're, if you can't come up with an answer, you can get depressed because you can't come up with an answer. But how many know that you have the answer inside of you? So if you're a Christian and, and got your eyes on your flesh and yourself, you're going to be the most miserable person. You're worse than a sinner. Because you know what you should be doing and you're not doing it, so you're most miserable about it. Okay, I'm cutting you off on this one, but listen. Listen to what the scripture says about this. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 9, it says, For those who live according to their self or flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, things of God, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally, fleshly minded is death, it will bring about death, but to be spiritually minded will bring about life and peace. Because the carnal mind, the fleshly mind, is enmity, division against God. For it is not subject to the law of God and will rebel every time. So then those that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh because you got born again. But you're in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So now if anyone does not have the spirit of God, you're not born again. You don't belong to God. You have a whole complete different set of rules. But for those Christians that accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and God has come to live in them, you have a new set of rules. Now you're treated as a child, not an enemy. In the Old Testament, everybody was a potential child or enemy. In the New Testament, those that are born again have God in them. They're a potential child of God. God deals with us differently. I don't beat my children. Neither does God. For a Christian to say, well, the Lord's leading me through the crud and the mud. You never know what God's going to do. You're deceived. If you hang out with God, he's always telling you what to do. How to do it. He will show you things to come. Didn't say, well, keep it from you. Only thing keeps us from not seeing what God has for our daily life is when we are into ourself. And then we got to be careful. Can you say amen? None of this negative part here is ever meant to make you feel bad. You just got to realize Satan's whole trick is to get your eyes to be filled with the world's ways. To get your eyes on other people because they will let you down. They will also promise you things. It's okay. But you got to discern it through the word of God. And keeping your eyes off yourself, because if you're one like some of us, I used to suffer with depression until God told me the cure. It says, part of that's an evil spirit that's dealing with you. And you can't drug an evil spirit. They love drugs. Now, I'm not putting what you need. I say, I take medicine too, but I take it in Jesus' name. Not because it's a cure-all. So if you're taking medicine or something to help you, take it in the name of Jesus. Don't let the devil get the victory for that. But don't lean on it as if it, that's the answer. Because then you'll be in them taking more, and taking more, and taking more. To, to maintain some kind of thing. It's all a deception, folks. It's a huge deception. And that deception started when you were old enough to know the difference between right and wrong. A spirit was attached to you to help start talking you into doing the wrong things. How do you know that? Because I've met them. I'd like to meet your evil spirits trying to corrupt your life. Someday we'll sit down and talk. So, we have an escape route. Can you say amen? Who does our eyes need to be on? And who has to help us to keep them there? Jesus, God has to. Amen. Eyes off the world, because it's passing away. So God will tell you what to invest. If you need to invest in something like a property or something, he'll show you which one will it'll do you good. So we don't all the way pull out of the world. No, we are the light of the world, and we're sent in it to be a standard of righteousness. So you live boldly, you live Jesus, 
You live full of faith and full of the good things of God because you get your instructions from him. You stop living your own life trying to impress people. Surrender. Become that basket case everybody wants to help. And let God put your life back together the way he wants them. If you got something out of that, will you give the Lord a praise? Gosh, amen. So key, it's going to take God to keep your eyes off that world. Hey, I, I, I look for a vacation. Just got back with a vacation. With vac I look forward to that, but that wasn't the world. I was in the world, but that wasn't the world. And when you're doing things, and when you're with your brothers and sisters in church, even though we're in the world, we're not of the world anymore. We get our substance from something else. And here's the neat thing. You can never take enough of God. Amen. You can't OD on him. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so there's nothing stopping you. You've got God in you now. There isn't a devil in hell that can keep you from having a relationship in the morning with God. It's only you and the deceptions that the enemy keeps you from doing it. And have you decided not to, not to try to impress the world? Well, that's good. God will show you how you can do it with him. Because the Bible actually says we'll make the Jewish people jealous because we listened to God and they did not. So if you got something, again, give the Lord praise. Bless you.